In 2005, two brothers hit the road to chase demons and fight monsters. You know, like you do. After 15 years, they made television history and built a community of dedicated and lasting fans. Sure did. I'm Rob Benedict, and I played God, a.k.a. Chuck Shirley. Yeah, you are, and yeah, you did. And I'm Richard Spade Jr., and I played the Archangel Gabriel, a.k.a. the Trickster, a.k.a. Loki. I also had the privilege of directing a bunch of episodes of the show. Have a few more a.k.a.s, why don't you? Jeez. A.k.a. you're a jerk. Though we've been involved with the series for years and multiple seasons, we never sat down and watched the entire show. Oh, that's not true anymore. Now... We're deep into it. We are going episode by episode and diving in with the folks who made it to bring you an insider's point of view and some great behind-the-scenes stories from the writers, producers, crew, and actors. And you're getting our pure, honest, unfettered reviews. And along the road, let me tell you, we're becoming fans. Buddy, we are super fans. We've heard you saying it for years, and we finally get what all the excitement's about. This show holds up after all this time and deserves to be watched and rewatched. We will be hitting on some spoilers, so consider yourself warned. And if you have any angry emails you want to send, please direct them to Babo. Thank you for joining our journey and listening to Supernatural Then and Now. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Benedict. And Richard Spate, Jr. And we're talking about Season 4, Episode 22, the grand finale of the season. Oh, man. That's right. It is the grand finale of the season. What's it called, Rob? It's called Lucifer Rising. Ooh, creepy. Yeah. yeah. So we did it, Rich. We did it. We're at the end of Season 4. A lot of people said we wouldn't make it through Season 4, nope. but we did. And really, I think what was in doubt was really the, our, our, our stamina. You know, they didn't. Yeah. Think. And also our ADD would take over and we would just not be able to pay attention to the show. But but but, you know, egg on their face because yeah. we did watch the whole show. Yeah. Watch the whole damn thing. Every um, episode of season four. Next week, of course, we'll have our wrap up. It'll be live streamed for our Archangel Patreon members, which is exciting. Oh, my gosh. I may join just to take a gander at what we're up to. That would be you nice I mean? of you, actually, because people would expect you to be there since you are the host of this show during the live stream. One of our lucky Archangel members will win a signed, bound copy of the monster at the end of this book. That's uh, that was the that's the great episode from this season. Where I don't know if you remember, Rich. That's when where they introduced the character of Chuck Shirley, and we're, they're going to get us not just not just signed. Sorry, buddy. It's been a long season. Sorry, who, yeah. did, who did? Yeah. What, what character? What, what did Chuck have to do with the? What was the episode about? Right, right, right. He's uh he's a monster at the end of a book. Okay, right, right. What, what, is he hideous? Like. Effed up face. Yeah, he's pretty. He's pretty ugly. Screaming into the night. Yeah, he's pretty ugly. Yeah. Here's my question though. It's signed. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't say signed by who, but bound. So they've actually went to a binder and oh, got it bound. They went to a binder. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe maybe what they're trying to say is it's bound to get signed someday. Ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right. <laughs> uh, so plus, I'm guessing you already know who our guest is. We'll be discussing. I, I don't. Who is it? Oh. Our guest of this episode is Mr. Eric Edward Kripke. E. Ed Kripke? Yeah, E. E. e Kripke. How did I know his middle name? By the way, you know his initials spell eek, which eek. is probably why he's been in the horror genre. That's amazing. His why? entire professional career. And now uh, I'm mad that we didn't ask him that. Eek! Well, we'll be discussing Lucifer Rising with him in this episode. However, we have a special spotlight episode with Eric that is available on the Patreon right now. So we discuss, we go way beyond, we discuss his early career and, of course, all things Supernatural. Um, yeah, it's a great conversation. Great it's a great conversation. conversation, so please check it out. What if he had a writing partner in his early days named, like, Andrew Abraham Harrison? And so he'd be like, eek! Ah! And, ah! <laughs> they get a kind uh, of rescue when he, eek! That's right. Ah! It'd that's be great right. to be the receptionist. Eek! And ah! Can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> Eek and ah, please hold. Uh, so check all that out on patreon.com slash SPN then and now. You don't want to miss that if you're a true fan. Uh, what a wonderful yeah, day. Test. Are you a fan or are you not a fan? Now this yeah. is where the rubber meets the road. Exactly. Are you or are you not? Prove it. If you're just a casual, like, stroll by here, listen occasionally, great. Like, glad to have you. You're not a true fan. You're not a, you're not a die-in-the-wool, right. right. supernaturals, in-your-blood fan. Right. Right. Unless you're on the Patreon. And I, I hate to throw down the gauntlet like that, but, uh, you know, that's how Rob and I feel. That's how Mainly we feel. Well. Yeah. All right. Let's get into it, shall we? Let's do it. Well, here's what we'd like to call the summary of the episode. 
So wait, this is when you summarize the episode, correct? That's it. Oh, wow. Okay. Do it. It's 1972. It's St. Mary's Convent. A Rob priest- Benedict is finishing college. <laughs> 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 Rich has just announced his retirement. A priest possessed by Azazel gives a homily about Lucifer and then slaughters eight nuns trapped in the chapel. Eight nuns, for those counting at home, is a boatload of nuns. That's a lot of nuns. That's a one-way ticket to hell. It's a baker's dozen of nuns. (laughs) Back in the present day, the brothers are split up. They're no longer dating? They're no longer dating. Sam is with Ruby, lamenting the argument with Dean, and feels it's best for him to stay away from his brother. Mm. Dean is at Bobby's, still angry at Sam and not interested in finding him. Bobby tells Dean he's being a coward and shouldn't be pushing Sam away. Mid-conversation, Dean finds himself transported to an ornate room where Castiel grimly tells him, it's almost time. At a hospital, a possessed nurse steals a baby for Lilith to eat. Hashtag gross. Sam shows up, saves the baby, and takes the demon hostage. He interrogates it, and the demon reveals that Lilith will be at St. Mary's convent tomorrow night. Ruby tells Sam to keep the demon alive so he can feed on it. The demon retreats into the nurse's mind, leaving Sam to confront the innocent, confused nurse. Yeah. Meanwhile, Dean is confronted by Zachariah in the green room. Zachariah tells him that Lilith needs to break the final seal to free Lucifer. Zachariah isn't answering Dean's questions. When Dean becomes frustrated, Zachariah reminds him that he pledged his obedience. Dean eventually calls Sam and apologizes. So Zachariah is hanging out in the green room, what, eating donuts and having a cigarette before he has to go? Yeah. And <laughs> uh, clock in? Yeah, making sure there are no red M&Ms. Yeah. Back in 1972 at St. Mary's Convent, Azazel is able to communicate with Lucifer through one of the dead nuns, who tells him that Lilith is the one, the only one that can break the final seal to free him. Or, or! <laughs> and that Azazel must locate a very special child. Wait, which Azazel? Azazel. Okay, so any Azazel. I thought it was a specific one. Any old Azazel will do. <laughs> okay, cool. Back in 2009, Sam is on his way to St. Mary's with the nurse in the trunk of the car. He listens to Dean's voicemail, but unbeknownst to him, it has been altered. The message is now Dean berating and rejecting Sam. Whoa. Yeah, this makes Sam upset. He tells Ruby to prepare to kill the nurse so he can drink the blood to build up his power to face Lilith. You know who's bummed about that altered message? The nurse. (laughs) Because he's like, you know what? I'm, yeah. <laughs> how dare he? You know what? Prepare the nurse. I'm killing the nurse. You hear the nurse in the trunk like, hold on. I think you two guys can work this out. That's it sounded what, altered to me. That's not what he actually said. In the green room, Dean pleads with Castiel to help him find Sam. Zachariah reveals that the angels want Sam to free Lucifer. They want the apocalypse to happen. While Zachariah is gone, Castiel draws his blood and inscribes an angel-repelling sigil on the wall, which sends Zachariah away. Right. Dean and Castiel then head back to Chuck Shirley's, looking for information that will help them find Sam. With a touch, Castiel sends Dean to St. Mary's convent. Mm. It's showdown time at the convent. Lilith and her fellow demons have gathered. Sam and Ruby arrive. Sam is supercharged and quickly defeats the demons and pins Lilith to the altar. Dean arrives to get in on the fight, but Ruby locks him out. Aw. Yeah. Sam hears Dean's cries and pauses for a moment. Ruby pushes Sam to focus and finish the job. Sam's eyes go black. He focuses his power and kills Lilith. Her blood fills the spiral on the chapel floor. Lucifer's cage is being unlocked. Sam is confused. Ruby reveals that she's been two-timing him the whole time. What? Yep, Sam and his unique powers have always been the key to unlocking the seal. Or, or. <laughs> Every time it really gets me. Dean breaks in and kills Ruby with her own knife. The brothers share a silent moment. They know what is happening. Bright light rises from the floor, consuming them. Lucifer is rising. Let's get into it. This segment, you know what I'm talking about. R, 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 Robin Rich Review. Dude, uh, yeah, how so, bummed must Dean be with Sam going like, I told you, Ruby was a bad egg. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, ugh, bummer. She had him going for, what, a couple seasons now. I mean, forever. Yeah. Enough to get engaged and get married in real life. 
Yeah, and have a bunch of kids. And have a bunch of I kids. If, I wonder if Jared still thinks that uh, Genevieve is good for the family. And how about how about the whole reveal that Lilith is the final seal? Or or that's that's the big reveal, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> And, and 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 it feels like this was kind of bound to happen. Ah, uh, look at you using the word bound again. Uh. <laughs> look, I like Catherine Beckner, great actress. Like yeah. like watching her play that character. Yeah. Super fun. And yeah, it's bound to happen. A lot of, you know, you knew it wasn't going to be smooth sailing for old demon drinking Sam. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm still trying to process it. You know what I mean? Like, well, let me try. Because it, well, I think you mentioned it the last time. It's really a two-parter. So you're you're kind of... It's the second half of a giant episode, really. You know it's almost I mean? a, it's almost a three parter, but yes. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I think it's good. Anything with Kurt Fuller in it, you know, it's got you know a full cast of of faves. You're in it. I'm in it. That moment uh, with uh, Misha always. I, I have a fond memory of that moment. Oh, the arm, the arm. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Shoulder. Yeah, it's funny. So like, you're in it. Catherine Beckner's in it. Misha Collins in it. Jim Beaver's in it. Kurt Fuller's in it. Obviously, Jared and Jensen. Uh, am I missing somebody? It's a oh, uh, Genevieve Cortese. Genevieve, of course. And then, of course, uh, if I said Catherine Beckner, I mean it's a a heavenly host of fabulous talent. Uh, yeah, and so so, so I mean I love the the whole idea of like that heaven was that is possibly like the whole thing was just it was going to happen. There was no stopping this from happening. Right, it was inevitable. Right, so you know this this was going to and and I just love this. It's a two parter, almost a three parter. Yeah, and. Really a four parter because this is a to be continued. And 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 right. I, I, I know for a fact that the, the first episode of next season it's it's a continuation of what of the what's just happened. I would so, also say that, you know, as guys who are just now catching up with Supernatural, this episode is I see a lot of clips of this episode, mainly Lilith up against the the altar. Mm-hmm. They use that shot a lot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in summaries of the series, of the season, and just yeah. great moments in the show. Yeah, Uh, because it's really an iconic image with her in the white dress up against the altar. Yeah. It's uh, really cool. No, it's an iconic episode. And, you know, and uh, directed by Eric Kripke, which was, which is always a special, special thing. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, I just, I guess I just want to talk about, like, to me, the the show is is reaching such a height right now. And it's, it, season four and season five were seminal seasons, I think. And, you know, to watch it in real time, it's, it's, it's really cool just the way that it all unfolds. I know where it's headed. I know who Lucifer is. And it's exciting sort of to see it sort of amping up to that. And, and, and also, I'm, I'm surprised as someone watching it for the first time, I'm surprised at how antagonistic the boys are with each other. You know what I mean? It's not, there's not like, yeah. you know, they've been antagonistic now for a while. When I think of them, I think of that, I love you, Sam, and that's my brother, and I'm not, not going to ever abandon you, and, you know, I'm bound to you for life kind of thing. But, like, really, they're just really at each other, and that's kind of the, the, the fuel of the series right now. Yeah, I know. It's a little different. And battling battling the biggest evil of all, like, Lucifer is is unleashed. So, I don't know. It's an exciting time. One hundy. Yeah. Okay, so what do you, ah, dude, what, like, what kind of beer ah. do you want to slap on this mother? Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Uh-huh. It seems appropriate. I'm not giving it a Stapleton. Okay, yeah, I could, t- I could tell. A 2024 Misha Collins. Oh yes, okay. Which is a solid, solid review. Yeah, it's probably just a step down from Stapleton. I mean, it's just. I feel like he's um. I feel like he's kind of cosplaying me and you because he's got the gray and the brown and gray beard. Just like yeah, yeah. my beard is never. I think his beard looks a lot healthier than mine. I'll tell right. you that right now. Fine. So I'm going. I'm going with 2024 Misha Collins. Very full. Uh, very impressive. Well groomed. Uh-huh. Uh, looks good. Uh, uh-huh. Flattering. Great uh-huh. beard. Uh-huh. Go with it for a long time and and be very happy. And that's just a great beard. A solid solid display of facial hair. Just maybe a step back from Stapleton. And honestly, maybe even the Stapleton thing is not happening because it's half of an episode. You almost need to review 21 and 22 together, but we're not doing that. So it gets the, it gets the Misha Collins. All right. 2024 Misha Collins. You? I'm going to I'm gonna give it to Kenny Loggins. I'm going to give it to Kenny Loggins, and I'll tell you why. What, what era Loggins? The We Are the World Loggins. The hell? The 80s? Did you not uh, see this documentary on the making of... Uh, I've seen, I've not seen it yet, no. Oh, it's uh, fantastic. On Netflix, it's a documentary about the making of We Are the World, and uh, everyone's talking about it. It's, it's, it's really fantastic. And Kenny Loggins... It's a vintage Kenny Loggins happening. So I'm going to give it a We Are the World Kenny Loggins because I think this episode is crucial to the entire series in terms of what it sets up. I'm going to give it the the old Kenny Loggins, the We Are the World Kenny Loggins. Do you think 
for all of his device at home when he calls in to get help and they go, well, what are your logins? He just says, Kenny, like, is it, is it, is it just a nonstop confusing fest where he calls in for IT support? <laughs> What's your logins? I need your logins. Kenny. No, it's Kenny. Right. I, I understand that, Mr. Logins. Yes, What's your Mr. Login? Loggins? I get it, but I need your logins. Uh, Kenneth? I don't know. Ken. <laughs> What if Kenny Loggins was a logger? Like he, he he did the trick where he wrote on the logs. Kenny Logger Loggins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what if Kenny Loggin the logger? His favorite drink, his favorite beer, of course, is a a logger. Yeah, right, obviously. Right. So and he starts to brew it. So it'd be Kenny Loggins Logger Logger. Or Kenny Logger Loggins Logger. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's great. But then what uh, he has to give up drinking, and so he has to say, uh I can't do Kenny Logan. I can't do Kenny Logger Logan's Logger any longer. <laughs> uh, what if he was the sheriff enforcing the law okay. and he had a gun? It's a special right. sheriff gun, so it's his law gun, <laughs> right? So is he, that's what he called it. <laughs> yeah, Kenny Logger's and, his law gun. Okay, but what if what if he wanted to can't drink anymore? Obviously, uh -huh. after his logging career and making beer, but he decided to turn into a career in the law. And so he started his own firm, and it was Kitty Logger Loggins, Logger No Longer Lawyer. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. Well, for those of you who are still with us. Okay. Well, this is really thrilling. We uh, had a chance to sit down with the creator of Supernatural, Eric Kripke. Does it get any bigger than that? Eric no. Kripke, he started the show. He started his idea, his brainchild. Yes, he's the real life Chuck Shirley, if you will. Yeah. You know him as the creator of Supernatural. Yeah. And the showrunner for the first five seasons. He's now, of course, overseeing The Boys and its various spinoffs. Uh, and he has quite an impressive resume that we get into in the interview. So let's just get right to it. Uh, here's our interview with the credible Eric Kripke. Okay, so now we're talking about Lucifer Rising. We've got Eric Kripke here. Hey, hello, and thanks again, Eric. Hi. Hey, Hi. thanks, guys. How I'm good. I'm still hello. good. Oh, you got this. You're holding up for people who are not watching this right. podcast because it's yeah. a podcast. He's holding up the script. He, he actually has yeah, right. the Some ultimate Some of our sheet. guests, yeah. they go back and they watch the show. Eric has the script, so he just read the script again. Yeah, I, I literally uh, this morning printed out the script and uh, reread it to refresh myself. Amazing. Um, okay, so this season yeah. marked a real change for the show. Urban legends turned to angels and demons. Was your back against the wall, urban legends like getting old, or was it more character motivated? Yeah, we were creatively bankrupt. I mean, just, <laughs> just I don't believe that. We were we were just uh, we were out. no, it was um it wasn't that we ran out of them. There were there was a ton more. It's that as the show went on, it sort of evolved away from a monster of the week episodes anyway, and, and a little more mythology. And like, it was hard to connect the urban legends, right? right? Like they're all fairly episodic and individual sure. in right. scope and, and pretty limited in scope actually. And as the show naturally evolves, it, it wants to just sort of naturally kind of expand out. And so you know, demons uh, obviously have been on the show from, you know, the first minute of Supernatural. And and I was very anti-angel for the first three right. years because uh, right. I didn't want to bring in anything that could help the boys. Right. I wanted them to be part of, of like the, the underdog, outgunned, outmanned thing I think is really crucial to their identity, yeah. like that they're always up against impossible yeah. odds. But then after reading, it's a lot of like, this is super comic book nerd, but it was um, Garth Ennis's run on Hellblazer, Mibs, that I really started to see. And then his his book, Preacher. Uh -huh, um, I know Preacher. And The Boys, which I'm right, doing now, right, is, right. Is, by, is by Garth. But he was like a huge influence because in Preacher, like the angels are like f***ing dicks, like scary dicks. Right. And 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 as I was reading that in between seasons, I was like, oh wait, we could do right. this where there's these demons, but what what are they in it for? Right. And what's the fight? And then once you can kind of like once like the none of us are biblical scholars to right. say the least, but like once you could lock yeah. in like the moving towards Armageddon yeah. and moving towards this fight between angels and demons. Another big inspiration. I mean, Neil Gaiman, I've I've said many times for Sandman, but um his book that he wrote with Terry Pratchett, Good Omens, that they just made yep. into a 
a show on on Amazon. Oh, but that book. is also building towards this huge war between right. angels and demons, and humans are kind of caught right. in the middle. And it's like once I sort of understood that math, you know, that diagram, it really opened up opened up the show, and that was sort of what we took in a season four, and then that's what culminates Love here. It. With the, Love with it, Lucifer, Lucifer, right? Lucifer rising. I I know that uh, I speak for Rob when I say we're both massive Kurt Fuller mm, fans. Yeah, dude. Um, and Kurt is so good in this season, and it's kind of we've had Kurt on. And it's kind of very yes, non curtian right. work. If you, I mean, yeah. like Kurt so often plays the funny, yeah. the, you know, the snarky humorist. And he, of course, he brings some of that to the role, which is why it's such a three dimensional, awesome character. But it is such a cool role for him. Question about that. So, Kurt Fuller auditioned for the show, because I, I know, because Kurt told mm -hmm. us that. When you're looking at your, oh, guys are coming in. Oh, shit, Kurt Fuller's coming in. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you immediately think, man, we're like, kind of swinging for the fences here? Because he was a known yeah. character actor at that no, point. No, for sure. And I mean, my reaction almost always when something like that goes down, I'm like, what's gone wrong in his life? <laughs> that, he, that he has to be, <laughs> he's coming in to us. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So no, it was it was amazing. And um uh correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it's a terrible life was was you know, he was like the CEO yeah. of the right. company was his exactly, first, yeah. First right, first exactly. Episode. And so he had a part that was a little more probably Curtian, as you right. said. It was it was like he he wasn't carrying the real menace of being right. an angel until the end, which is probably, you know, probably factored right. into casting him. But like, but I distinctly remember like he had these moments of he brought this. What I love about Kurt, yes, he's so funny and his, and he's so witty and his timing is impeccable. But like in this particular character, like he could be yeah. scary. Yeah. Um, and and he would show flashes of that in in that episode. And then we're like, oh, that's so mm -hmm. interesting. And then, you know, so much of the thing that's really fun about TV, there's lots that's horrific about it. But one of the fun things is you can start tailor making a character based on things the actor's doing in a way yes. that you can't when you're doing yeah. features. And um, you do that really well. Like, I mean, I think there's a lot of characters, you know, including the ones Rich and I were able to play that you you sort of took. And then you're able to sort of build based on the character that was cast, the, the person that was cast. Yeah. Yeah. You can sort of tailor a suit for yeah. the, for the yeah. actor. And the more you work with them, the more you right. can start like once you see, because you guys just, you know, you just start taking flyers right. in the film and we're watching it and we're like, oh my God, that's right. so cool. Look what they did. We should write right. to that. So right. then we that's would awesome. start to write a little more to Kurt's mix of being really witty yes. and you know and his di his dialogue in this one is sparkling yeah. <laughs> may i say dude i'm just kidding i'm not that but it really does it fits in no but it yeah. is like watching this i feel like you just at th that's what i'm saying like at this point i feel like you kurt now you're just you're just feeding the machine exactly what it needs to yeah. eat like his whole fe you don't don't throw feces the wall at the <laughs> yeah. wall like a spider monkey yeah whatever, yeah whatever, yeah like was just great and the way he delivered yeah. it was just yeah gold yeah. i know? mean it's it's nothing without his uh his delivery but the way that he can be you know really funny and witty and sort of blase about the uh -huh. apocalypse and then suddenly yeah, be scary yeah. you know and suddenly yeah. be intimidating and like that turn it really you know i think keeps you on your toes yeah yeah he's got a moment in this race he says something like you know so do as i say and that's really he's really icy cold yeah so do you so was yeah. this a second episode you re directed yeah this is okay. the second episode. So it was the I first directed, one, you know. I yeah. So I remember specifically when I worked on this episode, thinking that you all had spent a ton of time together. But really, for you, your base was L.A., right? So this was like, yeah, like it dawned on me that the, the you're you're not you're rarely in Vancouver, right? Yeah, I would I would be there for like two weeks in the beginning, two weeks right, at right, the end. Right. And then, you know, and then, and then would pop in a little bit during the season. I remember feeling like it was kind of a treat. It was like a treat that actually Eric's up here. It was a get... treat. Yeah, no, yeah. it is. It's a treat. It's really a great treat for me. It's a treat. It's a treat. It's... I'm sure your wife thinks the same <laughs> thing every time you walk in the room. Wow. What yeah, a treat. no, I get that a lot. Eric's here. Sometimes I'll go downstairs and she'll be like, what a treat. We're there. <laughs> and um, no, it's, it's, it's definitely. No, if, no, it felt like a cool, if it did, it felt, felt like a cool thing that you were actually they are directing, you know. Yeah, and directing's the best. Well, so my question is, how much did that affect your, as a director, you're breaking into that field. Did that affect the way you approached writing scripts after that? Oh, for sure, for sure. Like, the more that a writer can get their head around 
that's why it's so important for writers to pr just produce their episodes and, you know, all this stuff for the, the strike and everything. It's just so crucial because you just need to understand that what you're writing on the page actually has to turn into three dimensional space and then, and then directing even more so because right. I say it to my writers all the time, um, which is they'll pitch something and I'm like, okay, picture me on set with that actor. And they're asking me, why the f am I doing this? What do I tell them? Like real, really, because I'm someone's going to have to tell, explain that to them. Like why? Right. And and it really helps kind of clear out the clutter and really help you focus on in on a character. That's great. It's like you have to be able to define at any given moment what that character wants. And if that actor comes to you and says, right, hey, what you know? I mean, one the the cliche way to put it is, what's my motivation? But what they're what you guys are really saying is like, what's the thing that I want in this scene? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to say it. Right. You have to say like, you want to get out the door. You want to tear that guy's head off. Like, it just it everything comes down to that. And I learned that from, right. from directing. Ahoy, Rich Spade here. Hope you're enjoying the episode. But we got to pull over for a second for some messages. You can sense it calling out to you. New reality seeks you. Join the journey to save Anomaly. Place where sound is magic. The only way to enter the world is by looking inward. Along the way, you'll learn potions, chants, and enchantments that will help you both in that reality and yours. So, answer the call and let your campaign begin. Featuring the voices of Ruth Connell from Supernatural and Dead Boy Detectives. There are ordeals ahead, yet with guidance, you will face them head on without fear. Todd Stashwick from Star Trek Picard and Twelve Monkeys. When the time arrives, wherever your journey takes you, be there with no attachment. And R&B singer, N.C. Gray. There are worlds, realms, dimensions, and realities beyond yours. Anomaly is a role-playing meditation podcast that takes you into a world of magic and fantasy. You'll be invited to imagine yourself in scenarios such as learning to cast a tranquility spell or exploring a land vanquished by a dragon, but all connected by a shared mythology. The goal of guided fantasy role-playing meditations are to help you cultivate a sense of wonder, curiosity, balance and joy in your inner world. Role-playing meditation is a form of escapism and relaxation, as well as a creative outlet for the imagination. The first campaign is an introduction to the world of Anomaly, its lands, magic and secrets. In the eight chapters, you'll stretch your imagination, learn to center yourself, offer forgiveness, find confidence, relieve stress and stop racing thoughts. Your true self will emerge, allowing you to manage your goals and dreams without confusion, distrust or self-doubt. You can find it on Spotify, Apple and wherever you listen to podcasts. Or visit SeekAnomaly.com to learn more. Anomaly spelled with an I-E, not a Y. Seek Anomaly. Hear its magic. Thanks for listening. Now back to the episode. So here's a question. You you talk about the importance of writers understanding that process. Do writers on the boys produce their episodes? Like, are they on set for their episodes? Um, they are. So, but so do you say that, that so the writers were on for the boys, but that was not a, the process of supernatural. No, no. It, and it's and, true. And was that your call or how did that, that was, happen? That was Bob. That's one thing I would do different. I would have the, the writers be on set. Um, you know, Bob said, and you know, and he came from a world where a lot of your writers were freelance, you know, and not like producers living with the show. So I understand. Right. And it was just a slightly different process. And, but his feeling was, and he's not wrong, but his feeling was a writer is going to get maybe two or three catches a day that actually change what's going to be on the screen versus 
their asses in the room and and can actually really move the ball forward. And he's he's not wrong. He's not wrong. There's a lot of just sitting around when you're a writer. But the thing that I learned um, and why I insist all my writers are on set now, yes, they're useful when something goes wrong up there, but they come back so much yes, more useful. right. Because now they yeah. understand... Yeah. They got to watch that actor up close. Yeah. They know what's working. They understand right. the geography of the set mm -hmm. so they can write mm -hmm. to it. Like they, it, it's an education that mm -hmm. makes them crazy better at writing the yeah. shows that they're on. I would imagine also is that that factor in the, it's the old storming the beaches of Normandy one sentence. Like when they do something and they say, oh, that one sentence I wrote took uh Four days to prep and 12 hours to oh, shoot. yeah. Hmm. Like, <laughs> maybe I should rethink that yeah, next time. Yeah, or like whenever a young writer, because uh, it, it, it happens all the time on every show I've been on, like you have a young writer and, and, and they've got like action scene, night exterior. And I'm like, are you sure you want that yeah. one, brother? And they're like, we got it. It's going to be great. I'm like, good luck <laughs> with that. And like, in like February in Toronto <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> you know, and they yeah. come back with like a glassy, and they're like, maybe it should have been, maybe it should have been day. <laughs> and you're like, like yeah, yeah, inside, probably should have. Yeah. Inside the roller <laughs> rink. <laughs> um, do you yeah. remember, there's a camera trick you use when Dean smashes the wall and then he kind of turns back and it's fixed. Do you yeah. remember how you did that trick? Yeah, well, I, uh, a lot of the things in that, in sort of that magic. Magic room. Magic yeah. angel room. I had it, and I don't know why, because I'm so, this is reasonably douchey, but like, I wanted as many gags as we could in terms of that shifting room. I wanted them all to be practical um, and not do split cameras and everything. So that one particularly was there were carpenters off camera who had a fresh panel. And so he would smash them and then you would go back and then, and then when we were on him and then you pulled the panel and put the fresh oh. one in. It's incredibly well done. It's incredibly well done because I, I watched that sequence a couple of times because I was, I love that you're doing practical and I love that you did it with the burgers right. and the beer. He goes by the empty table. He turned around, burgers right. and beer. He did the the smashing on the wall and I, and the, the Castile reveal, but the Castile reveal makes more sense. I mean, Right. You understand how the sausage right. is made because the actor's stepping right. in. But I literally watched the beer and, and burger one, and I'm like, okay, I know exactly what's happening. There, two people just are crouched off camera as soon as it goes yeah, past exactly. them. They set it down. and They're all, all of those burgers and you know? beers were glued together. Right, right. Um, so that someone yeah. could hold them on a platter who was just off camera. That's amazing. And then we could put them there because I, I wanted... You know, I wanted, I, I did feel, and it's probably true that like, it wouldn't have been as cool if it happened in cuts. Yeah. You want to prove that things are magically appearing. A hundred percent. No, it's really a good device, man. Oh, thanks. It's a really cool device. And the, but back to the wall one, the wall one is yeah. incredibly fast. Yeah. 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 And the the other one I remember about that room that um, it didn't quite turn out quite as well as I wanted, but like. The door? No. Well, I was really interested in Kurt sitting in between two mirrors and then going off into infinity. Yes. I, lo I love that shot. Dude, that was great. Cool. It, it was so cool. A little, I, if, it's like, if I could do it again, I would, I, like, he's got too much headroom and there's a there's a cooler place to put the camera, but... But right away you see the brrr on down. That's cool. Yeah, you do. You, do, you We're behind a two-way mirror. Uh, and then there's a real mirror opposite Kurt. Uh, um, and I was really obsessed right, with right, trying right, to get right. that. Uh, Cool. Right. But I think ultimately I couldn't quite get the camera where I needed it to be as, as we all have suffered. Right. But yeah, it was like a fun, cause it's like a magical space. And at some point the paintings change and it's just like, it's a living thing, that room. And that, that, uh, that was fun to, to f around with. The thing I remember about that room was, you know, and we're on a network show, so you don't get to like, you got to make your days and you got to shoot them out and whatever. Like as the carpenters, or probably the, some of the grips, like as the grips were moving through the room, one of them tagged the chandelier with, with their ladder. Totally understandable mistake. But like the chandelier starts swaying and I'm like, well, can someone stop it? And like, well, no, because it'll just keep swaying and, and then you'll bump it. And then, so no, we just have to wait. Oh my God. We have to wait for it to stop oh my swaying. God. 15 minutes. Jesus. Isn't that crazy? 15 minutes, yeah. the entire crew is staring at this fucking chandelier 
oh my waiting God. for it to stop. And I <laughs> wanted to put a gun in my mouth. Oh, like, I can't believe I'm... I'm sure the grip who did it too was like, I'm just going to go <laughs> yeah, lay down under that exactly. sofa real quick. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They had to feel terrible. Yeah, yeah. It's a funny moment when Chuck places his hand on Castiel's shoulder. He wants to know if it's improv or not. Do you remember that? At the very end, we're looking into the light. And I and I put my hand on his shoulder and he kind of looks at my hand and I take my hand off. And I feel like we did come up with that on the day. Yeah, we're, yeah, that was funny, Rob. I'm, I noted that. Right. That feels like something that was definitely done on the day. I feel like you were like, I want, it was a weird tableau with just, just standing next to each other. We wanted there to be something. And I think feel like we came up with that on the day. Yeah, I, I think for sure yeah. you guys did. You were always very open. Sure, to... I can prove it to you. Yeah, there we go. You got the script. Yeah, what happens when they're standing there? In the script, Chuck nods at the absurdity of it all. Then the light grows so bright, it blows the entire frame to white, leaving Castile and Chuck on the edge of the proverbial yeah, cliff. so that's so it. There yeah. it was, not yeah. in the script. There it is. That's There's proof. Having proof. fun on set. You Coming guys... up with ideas. Yeah, I know. And it's so cool yeah. and fun. And that's where all the cool. good shit where all the good shit comes from. Yeah. So the final two episodes, when the levee breaks and Lucifer rising, uh, have incredible character moments and performances. Were you guys aware, mm -hmm. sort of going into that, like, okay, you're kind of building to this, right? Yeah, like you know, this this big Sam and Dean yeah. split, and and I'll tell you uh, who deserves a round of applause for this episode is um, Genevieve uh, Jen yeah. Padalecki is remarkable yeah. in this episode. Genevieve, yeah. Um, Genevieve, she's great. You know, like the way she, the way she plays that yeah. speech at the end, and and she's just like desperate and proud yeah. and pleading and in love. And anyway, yeah. it was just like it was really. Yeah, she crushed it. Yeah, great moment. Yeah, and then you know, um, like we knew that like there's that Bobby uh, Dean scene, yeah. and the way Jim like explodes on Jensen yeah. when he's turning yeah. his back yeah. on Dean. Like I remember like that. I remember distinctly remember being behind the monitors being like, oh, shit, that's exciting. That's wow. He, you know, like just the way all of you just, yeah. you know, you commit yeah. to it and you get and you go all the way in. And, and yeah, that felt very honest too for Bobby. Like it felt like the yeah. right move, you know, what, yeah. what he would actually do in that situation. Yeah. Right. Well, um, just a couple more questions and we'll let yeah. you go. So as the EP, you often, you're giving guidance from afar and hoping it makes it to the front lines. Um, you directed this episode. How's that pressure different? In a lot of ways, it's a lot more intense. You know, look, it's a season of running a television, especially like network TV. Like, I'll never can do that again. I mean, 22 episodes, 23 episodes a year. Like, that's Crazy. ridiculous. I'm not sure that's going to exist anywhere yeah, though, anymore. Yeah. I think that may be a dying ember. You know, and look, I take a certain amount of pride that in the world of show running, like I've it's like, you know, the the few of us that are still around that are like, we're extreme sports, you yeah. know, like, you know, we, we were the big yeah. wave surfers yes, of the show runner totally. world where it's just like, it's so totally. stupid. Can't you use that in your writer's room to your advantage? Like if somebody's like exhausted and it's episode nine, you're like, listen, mofo, <laughs> exactly. you, we weren't even a third of the way done um, by now. So suck uh, it up. Thousand percent. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, like, yeah, bro, good for you. we're doing eight episodes. Yeah. Like put, yeah. let's, yeah. let's yeah. chill out. <laughs> <laughs> You'll survive. And it makes you really confident too, because you're like, I've done the worst and hardest version of, of this yeah. job. Uh, I forget what the original question was. I was just, just more so pressure, lost more that. pressure being up there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's hard, right? But at the end of the day, you're in an office every day. It's an office right. job, you know, like you go in, there's a lovely lunch that someone, you know, that a PA has to pick up. You're you're at a desk, you know, like it's it's not physically strenuous. Right. It's still even right. on on hard days, just because you can't write much longer. And there are ten hour days, eleven hour days right. at the most. So you know, I always said like directing, and you can only really I can only really do it at the end of the season when all the scripts are done. And and it's sort of like directing when you direct. It's like you climb Everest throughout the season, and then you get at the top of Everest, and waiting at the top of Everest is another Everest in a totally different right. way. So it, the exhaustion, you know, I just directed the season four finale, and it all came rushing back oh, yeah. on the boys, and it all came rushing back because you're so, like, just drained from getting a season yeah. out, and then, then you dive into the 15 hour 16 hour days the far flung locations the you know how sharp you have to be right. all yes. the time those last 2 hours of of directing 
on any given day is brutal because you're oh, exhausted sure, yeah. and and you're the one who has to be yeah. sharp. So I'd say like it's physically really physically demanding, really yeah. demanding, but directing is the best. I like directing more yeah. than writing. I, I mean, I would I oh cool I'd prefer it. It's it's just you get to work with you guys and you get to really build yeah. it, you know, and and find it, and that's a blast. And I love working with the both of you. I mean, yeah. it's it's great to have a fun a director who 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 can wear multiple hats too. Yeah. I think that helps. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a cowboy hat, and sometimes sometimes a cowboy hat, a chef's hat, a beret. No, hold on, I, Rob. I before we go to the last question, I don't want to do the last question yet because I want to ask a question that I, I kind of I thought we were going to ask earlier uh, and we, we didn't get to it. But I want to I want to confirm or deny a story that's been told to us by an actor on the show, a young fellow, Misha Collins. And this is mm. Misha Collins Misha reported Collins. to us. I'm trying to place yeah. it. I'm trying uh, you to may not remember it. him. He had a smaller role. Yeah, yeah, he was kind of there in and yeah, out yeah. real fast. Not an impact player. Misha. Um, <laughs> He says that at some point, I can't remember the details of this, Rob, fill, fill in the gaps if you do, that he he had been doing episodes, and but was just doing freelance episodes mm -hmm. as Castiel. And at some point, he came to you or called you or something and said, I think you should make me a series yeah. regular, to which you said, okay. Right. One, a thousand percent true. Wow. And two, I remember that distinctly. And that was like a moment. There's many moments I fell in love with Misha. And that was a big one because he's talking about it. Like, I mean, I asked him for like, like, as if he, like, I asked for a job and he gave it to me. My take on it was totally different, which is like, you could, we could lose him at any given moment to another show. And he wasn't really asking for much more money at all. This wasn't like a, Hey, give me a ton of money. I think he wasn't even asking for a raise period. I think he came in and he said, Hey, look, I really love this show. And I really see it as a big opportunity for me. Like bring me on as a regular at, you know, at what you're paying me and lock me in in first position. So I can't go do other stuff. If it comes up, I want to be here. I want to be committed to this. And yeah, job security, he was seeking more than anything else, <laughs> probably, right? I mean, kind of. Probably, but, but I took that, I took that as like, that's amazing, dude. Like, you know, you're not trying to, you know, game the system and get a bigger role out. In a, like, like the commitment, I remember just being so yeah. honorable. Uh, I'm sure for him, it was like, yeah, I got a steady job and a big fat f***ing raise. <laughs> and I just, I really, really pull a fast so one he on sees, that asshole. He's series regular in season five. <laughs> I think like halfway through season four, he I, I feel oh, wow. like he became certainly season five. Yeah, certainly I, season five. I, tell, I tell you, I don't know if you know this, Eric, but that story never happens. I just want you to uh, be happen. abundantly clear. A, actors don't ever ask, right. but if they do ask, they ask John Mills and John Mills goes, or you can go for <laughs> well, you know, like yeah. it never it never works out to be a a yes. I, it's like, I was you know I was like what a great fucking guy. I rem I mean I I remember it as amazing. That's great. Well, Misha is a great guy, and I'm sure the way he presented it was, as you say, genuine and humble and and exactly as he is. Once we locked him in, he proceeded to shit the bed over and over. <laughs> and that's when he bought the DeLorean and started wearing fur yeah, pants. Yeah. I know. That's, you know that's look, that's man, that's... don't buy the cow if you get the milk for free. Everybody knows exactly. it. <laughs> he's wearing, Everybody. That's a, he's wearing leather suits. That's hilarious. Smoking just cigars on, on, on the screen. VFX it out. I'm not putting it out. <laughs> anyway. All right, we have one more question. And th that question is, in Lucifer Rising, the green room that Dean wakes up in resembles the room that Dave wakes up in at the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Ooh. Is that intentional reference? I actually, that rings a bell. I mean, I don't, I don't have like immediate recall, but I remember, I remember Jerry Wanick. He always is presenting like uh, concept art. And I think he, in terms of like that type of furniture and that type of stuff, I remember right. him showing me images from 2001. So I'm going to say yes. Right, I'm going right. to say that's a yes. Okay. I like that. I like yes, it. It's a hard yes. There you great. go. Yeah. Uh, dude, uh, please, please let this not be the last time we do this. Yes. Please. I mean, it's so great having you on and talking about it. No, it's fun talking to you guys, man. I, I, I love hanging out with you guys. This is fun. So fun, Eric. Awesome. And uh, honestly, a real treat yeah. to chat with you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, I'll, I'll look if, if I had the choice between actually working or douching it up. 
about what a treat I am. <laughs> right, you bet, I think there's one, and you bet your f-ing ass I'm going to pick that. I mean, come on. There's one takeaway. <laughs> it's that I'm a treat. From today is that you're it's a so treat. funny. And it's like, you're a treat. That's where yeah, we're all going. He's a real really treat. really knows me. They're like, oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, and I'm like, you, and <laughs> I, and, is not the and word. I'm like, I know what it's like inside my head. I am not a treat. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. Love you, buddy. Thanks for coming yeah, on. I love you guys. Shake. Thanks, guys. That was fun. It's good seeing you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, this is Jeffrey Dean Morgan. We are going to take a quick break. Hey, it's Jeffrey Dean Morgan again. Welcome back to the podcast. Well, that was great. Yeah, it was great. And you know what? We always talk about origin stories here on the podcast. We do, but you don't get uh, you don't get more origin than the guy who had the idea, uh, uh, <laughs> than right, the guy who right. came up with the concept. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no Eric Kripke, no Sam and Dean. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We we ask everybody like, so what's your? How did you come across Supernatural? But uh, yeah, this is the man who who thought it. He literally he gave birth to this whole baby in his brain, and yeah, I, I love it. I love I love hearing how he te- teamed up with Bob Singer. I love that that he's like, yeah, Bob wanted to leave me alone and play golf. So I hired him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. He's so great and uh, such a nice guy too. And yeah, and like I said, I, I remember specifically that it was a really special thing having him up in Vancouver directing this episode. It was cool to be a part of that, you know, having the guy, the man there. Yeah, well, that was fun. What fun. Really yeah. interesting guy, funny guy, smart guy, and a great interview. I give the interview a Kenny Loggins. I give the interview a Chris Stapleton stapled to a Kenny Loggins. Oh, Interesting. Well, with a log gun. Drinking a lager, obviously. <laughs> uh, all right, shall we get into the mythology? Uh, we can, if you want to go down that road. But if we're going to do that, then I have to do this. Mythology! 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 So, let's talk about St. Mary's College. You mean Hell, Hell House? The Hell House, yeah. yeah. There are numerous legends about this now-closed seminary in Ilchester. Maryland. Never heard of it. I mean, I actually didn't know this is a real thing, based on a real thing. Me neither, until just now reading about it. Hmm. So, tell us about it, Richard Spade. Oh, hold on. I can read this. You're right. Uh, It was founded in 1868. It eventually closed in 1972 due to dwindling student enrollment. I guess the whole Hell House thing didn't look good on the pamphlet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rumors surrounding the true cause behind the closure of the college began to spread soon after its closing. One such rumor suggested that a deranged priest had gruesomely murdered several female students. Another tale told of a priest violently sexually assaulting nuns within the college, which, no thank you to all the above. Not good. You know what I mean? No. The narrative's conclusion varied across rumors. In one version of the story, the priest evaded capture while demonically possessed nuns unleashed carnage upon the college's residences. Well, no wonder. Bummer for the college residents. Yeah, like, they're like, "Hey, are you going to catch the priest? We're going to, but we're worried that the possessed nuns that he's, uh, <laughs> you know, infiltrated may unleash carnage. So I'd maybe stay out of the quad." Jeez, Louise, I, I know. Unless you I, want uh, carnage unleashed uh, upon you, I can't believe this is real. I can't believe this is an actual. Shocked. Alternatively, some accounts describe the discovery of the nuns hanging by nooses with a blood-drawn pentagram below, and the priest dead by his own hand. Ah. Despite St. Mary's College's identity as a seminary for men, not a convent, these stories, among others, circulated widely, earning the institution the moniker Hell House College. Yeah, that, that tracks. Which looks good on a, on a, on a pamphlet. <laughs> so, uh, I see you have a lot of work experience, and oh, a graduate <laughs> of Hell House College. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Go demons. You, uh, were you there during the, yes, the unleashing of the carnage? Yes, I was. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. Yeah. Now, th- as if that wasn't fun enough, it's time for <laughs> fun facts, fun facts, fun facts, fun facts, fun facts. The newspaper with the article on the priest killing the nuns is dated for Friday, October 16th, 1972. However, October 16th, 1972 was a Monday. I knew it. Ah. It ate at me the entire episode. I'm going to change my beard rating. Uh, <laughs> Father Lane. A priest possessed by Azazel is named after Frederick Lane, our very own Freddie Lane. Yeah. The actor who played Azazel 
during the show's second season. Wow, that's quite an honor. Yeah, man. There's no Father Benedict in the show. Hell no. Uh, Which would have made more sense. When Lucifer's cage opens, it opens with bright white light. This is appropriate because Lucifer's name means bringer of light. Also, ruiner of parties. (laughs) I had no idea. Bringer of light. And reigner of carnage, I guess. Um, (laughs) The green room features several Renaissance paintings, including Blind Man Bluffs by Jean-Honoré Fragnard. Landscape with Nymph, Egeria, and Mourning over Numa, which, by the way, could have used a workshop with the title department, by Claude Lorraine. St. Michael Killing the Dragon by Jossie Lefernier. You're doing great. The Damned Cast into Hell by Luca Signorelli. And Last Judgment. <laughs> There's also the name of uh, the uh, actors in Supernatural. Luca Signorelli? No, the damned cast into hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what the casting office is called. Yeah. And Last Judgment by Stefan Lochner. That's great. You killed it. Thank you. You really killed it. During the scene with Chuck on the phone, the current draft of Lucifer Rising is on his computer screen. It has his address listed as Kripke's Hollow, Ohio. 43301. 43301 is the zip code in Marion, Ohio, which is 90 miles south of Toledo, Ohio, where Kripke was born and raised. You can also see Chuck's email, which is carveredland at gmail.com. And interestingly, wow. Wow. Rob's home address is as follows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet Trey cut that out. Trey, uh, <laughs> I just gave out Rob's address and you cut it out, you jerk. Interestingly, and not, not related, Rob's phone number is... <laughs> That's funny. Uh, wow, I I was there. I mean, I th- I feel like I maybe saw that it was Kripke's Hollow, but I didn't obviously didn't link all that together. Uh, and the fact that there's an email, I wonder if anyone ever stole that email. Well, they have now. Yeah, now they have. Uh, well, that's some interesting, fun, fun facts. The uh, do you want to do another reading of the green room uh, Renaissance paintings, or you think we're good? Yes, I do. You ready? <laughs> Here they are. <clears throat> Blind Man's Bluff by Jean Honoré Fragonard. Mm. Landscape with the Nymph Egeria and Mourning uh-huh. Over Numa. Again, too long a title. Uh-huh. Let's just call it Nymph. I mean, that, now you got my attention. Anyway, Claude Lorraine. Mm. St. Michael Killing the Dragon, which is not a euphemism for anything, I don't think, but I haven't seen the painting recently, <laughs> by Jossie Le Fernier. <laughs> the yep. Damned Cast Into Hell by Luca Signorelli. Uh-huh. Last Judgment by Stefan Lochner. I really am in the pocket today. You know what I mean? You really are. You really are. I'd like to think that the only name you mispronounced is Stefan Lochner. <laughs> He's like, it's Lochner. Or Claude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, great job. Great, great job. job. Uh, great episode. Great interview. Just great. Yeah, man. Great, great, great. Uh, just a flurry of greats. Uh, and well done this season, Richard. Good job. Season four, you killed it. I guarantee you that it will that I that I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna clock out after season five because because yeah. my character's not in the show for a while yes. after that. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> no emotional reason to stay. I'm excited about season five. We got the introduction of Lucifer. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, uh, I know for a fact we've got Richard Spate's uh, character coming back. Yeah, can't wait to find out who plays Lucifer. That'll be interesting. Yeah, I know. I hope we can get to whoever that is on the podcast. Surprises are coming. All right, good stuff. And uh, onwards and upwards, my friend. On to the next season. See Season you five. there. This episode of Supernatural features Jared Padalecki as Sam Winchester, Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester, and Misha Collins as Castiel. Guest stars include Jim Beaver, Genevieve Padalecki, Rob Benedict, Kurt Fuller, Catherine Beckner, Rob LaBelle, Juliana Wimble, and art by Jean-Honoré Fragonard, Claude Lorraine, Josie <laughs> Lefernier, Luca Signorelli, and Stefan Lochner. Lucifer Rising was written and directed by Eric Kripke. Editing by Tom McQuaid. Music by Christopher Lennertz. Executive produced by Eric Kripke and Robert Singer. The original broadcast of this episode featured the song Carry On, Wayward Son by Kansas and featured art by artists like Jean-Honoré <laughs> Fragonard, Claude Lorraine, Josie <laughs> Lefernier, Luca Signorelli, and Stefan Lochner. <laughs> That's Lochner! This episode originally aired on May 14th, 2009. This episode of Supernatural Then and Now was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spate Jr. and Rob Benedict. 
Produced by Stephen Hine, written by Stephen Hine and Hayda Holscher. And edited and associate produced by Trey Booty. What's up, Buddha? Music provided by Tim Wynn. This episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. The podcast, this podcast is from Story Mill Media. Follow the podcast on Instagram and TikTok at SPN Then and Now. And become a member of the podcast at www.patreon.com forward slash SPN Then and Now. Dude, that's the first. P- people will watch the episode, but nobody looks over yeah. the script to get their <laughs> memory jog. Good Weirdly, it's quicker for me. Yeah. <laughs> just go over the script. You're like, oh, that one. Right. Yeah, you can come. <laughs> it's my one. All right, Dana. Is it a treat to have Eric sitting in that room? <laughs> okay, here, but yes. um, <laughs> oh, because we're, um, doing, uh, uh, we're doing a pod- <laughs> We're doing a podcast. <laughs> she rolls her yeah, eyes. Good. good. <sighs> So that's yeah. the kind of treat. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what my wife does all too. All our partners yeah. do the same thing. I'm still laughing at first time listener, long time caller. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> I keep calling, but I don't know what I'm listening to. Storybell Media.